stand together and uh, let's get our hearts ready for this next session today.
the Spirit of God just continue to work and move here today. Captivate our hearts by your word and your principles, your ways. God, strengthen our marriages today. We thank you, Lord, for setting us free from the past, all the things that we brought into our relationships, all the things that have been established in our marriages, God, just giving us a fresh start, the faith and the courage to begin building again. Lord, on the foundation of your word, and we thank you for that now. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated today. Session four, raising great children as you build a great marriage. We actually need to do both, and it's possible to do both. Principle number one says that marriage precedes children in priority. We talked about that in the law of priority. So we're kind of doing a little review here, but it's good to hear again. Your marriage must be a higher priority than your children. It's damaging to believe that nothing is important as our kids. Have you ever heard this said, or maybe you've actually said it before and not really thought about it, but, oh, I'm just living for my kids. That's why I'm here. It's all about my kids. Well, no, it's really not all about your kids. It's God first, your spouse, your marriage second, then your children. Our relationship with God and our spouse takes priority over our children. We must prioritize our marriage above our children, and there are many reasons why this is critical, and we're going to look at a few of them. We know from Genesis 2.24 that marriage only works when it is above the children. It says marriage only works when it's most important. And, you know, once we violate that law, we know that things are not going to work well. Our relationship with God and our spouse enables us to actually be good parents. Have you ever been on an airplane? Well, if you are on an airplane, you know that you always hear this announcement. Um, The the flight attendants usually make it. Now it's actually sometimes where it's on the, actually just recorded and you hear it. But what it says is, what do you do when, if you need to use the oxygen mask? First thing you do is you put it on yourself before you put it on your child. And you know there's a reason for that, because dead parents are of no use to their children. (laughs) And it only takes a few seconds to lose oxygen, and then you're not going to be able to help your children. So when you think of it from that context, it's like we know that if we will have our relationship right with God, our relationship right with our spouse, a good marriage, that's actually such security for our children. That's like putting that oxygen mask on first. Your children's security and happiness, that comes from you having that positive relationship. There's actually been research that has been done that has proven that even if you're not like discussing, fighting out loud, if there's tension, the children can pick up on that. And it will affect them. It even affects them physically. They've, 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 proven that most of the time, many times when children are sick, it's because of that. So raising children, it's a temporary task, but marriage is for a lifetime. You know, the children are going to leave, and when they leave, they don't want you following them all over. (laughs) That's news, okay? (laughs) They want you to have a good marriage. We talked about that. So really, if you think about it, this is what we should be able to say. We should be saying, I want my child's marriage to be just like mine. I want my child's church to be just like mine. I want my child's everything about you. I want that relationship that I have with God, you know, because you're living it out. That's what you're saying. I want this. I want my child's to be like this. I want my child's marriage to be just like mine. If you can't answer yes to that, then there are some changes that need to be made. One of, the, one of the things that we actually asked our uh, two adult children to do as we were preparing um, to teach this curriculum, 
um, we had asked them to answer a question for us um, about what, what did they see modeled in our marriage and how, what would they say as far as what is our marriage all about. And this is actually one of the um, treasures for me, reading this, to hear what they've said. I've cried many times reading this. <laughs> I might cry again. <laughs> but this is, uh, by watching us, our children said that they learned this about marriage. And this is what our son said. For the, He learned three things. The first one was that your spouse is your best friend. And our daughter said, um, in regards to that, she said she learned the same thing as that. And also that marriage is meant to be done together, meaning that you don't live separate lives. I was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you that they saw that. The second thing that our son said that he learned um, by watching us in marriage was that tithing will bring God's blessing. And our daughter said the same thing. And she said she also learned that talking about major purchases beforehand and budgeting to make sure that you can, um, you know, have the resources to do that. Um, she said that that was a good thing that she learned. But, okay, good, good money thing. <laughs> and then the third thing that our son said that he learned was that you need to get over conflict quickly, communicate, and move on. And our daughter said the same thing. And don't try, don't stay mad at each other. You know, just deal with the issue. And then the last thing that our daughter added to it was um, that she also learned that it's very important that you support your children and your grandchildren. And so I'm like, Lord, thank you. If, if, if you have helped us to pass that on to the next generation, then that's going to be passed on. You know, we talked about those iniquities, but guess what? Blessings are passed on for thousands of generations. So that is something that, that is very much a treasure in my heart. Okay, what we want to look at now is um, if you forsake the marriage for the sake of your children, what will it do? Not, not good things, but the first thing that, that it can do is it can send you into depression and, you know, when your children leave. Now, I'm not saying that it's not hard when, you know, you've spent all your years raising your children. And then for me especially, when our son left to go to college, you know, and he was 18, that was really hard. Um, again, it's not like you're not going to be sad about your children leaving. Now, now, I have to confess, my husband did not have as much difficulty with our son leaving. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, I mean, he even had a, the, the deer talk with him. <laughs> you can ask him what the deer talk is, but there's only one buck in a house. Let me just tell you that. <laughs> he had to let him know that. And he was the dominant buck, so <laughs> there you go. Um, so he didn't have as much trouble with him leaving. And when our, when our daughter left, I was like, oh, that's that's fine. She knows. She's good. My husband cried. So there we go. <laughs> you know? But the, th the fun thing is, you know, there's freedom in your house when your kids leave. I mean, you can do things that you couldn't do when they were there. So anyway, <laughs> um, so don't let it send you into depression. Um, and then, you know, the second thing that we will forsake is uh, it will make you overly dependent upon your children and set you up for being a problem in law. We talked. We just talked about that. If you are focusing on the children, then you're not focusing on your marriage and and making that all that it can be. Uh, the third thing that we'll do is it will make your children overly dependent on you. You don't. We don't want our children to be overly dependent, and it will set them up for problems in their marriage. Again, who who makes the decisions in the home? You know, as a as a husband and a wife. You pray to God and ask what he wants you to do. And I'm not saying that you never ask your, your parents for input and your in-laws. Of course you can do that. And, and they have valuable things to share, I'm sure. But, you know, it really comes down to what are you hearing from God as a couple. Fourth, cre it, it can create resentment within your spouse that grows over time. If you place anything out of priority, it's going to create that resentment. So how do, how do we establish and protect proper priorities? The first thing that we do is we establish healthy disciplines and traditions. Um, you don't have to call them a date night, but you can have times where just you and your spouse are together. And I know that that's not always easy when the children are young. You know, how do you do this? We're not talking about spending lots of money and going places. I mean, it might be as simple as um, you are going to know that at the end of the night, 30 minutes, you're going to go, you're going to pop some popcorn, that's a low-cal little 
you know, treat. <laughs> you're going to pop some popcorn, and you're just going to sit down. And I know for women this sounds so good. And you're just going to talk for about 20 to 30 minutes. <laughs> now, doesn't that sound like a good date night, ladies? <laughs> the men, okay, it's okay. Once you talk to her, you just, you just never know how she might warm up to you. So there you go. <laughs> but we have these date nights. You know, schedule some family nights. Um, that's how you can establish these traditions as well. One of the things that we have loved doing this summer, um, we said we, we had a pool in, in the home that we lived in before. We said we'd never put a pool in again. Then we moved and we were close to grandchildren. And <laughs> guess what we have? We have a pool. Uh, but one of the fun things about that is um, there are some Sunday nights where we don't have services, and so we actually have time where we all are swimming together and Mimi, we get to go to Mimi and Papa's house, and we, we grill out, and it's just a fun family time. But we try to do that one, one night during the week so that we have those family times. And then also, I would encourage you, there, there, it's, it's good to have some times where you could just get away. Just get away as a couple. I mean, I know that that's not easy to have all that come about, you know, because we all have demands. But make that a priority. You have to, you have to be intentional, and you have to schedule it. Budget your time and energy in the same manner you would your money. This one has actually been more of a challenge for me because I'm like, okay, I want to get everything done, um, you know, even before our time comes at night, you know, pick up the house, do this, do that. No, because then sometimes if you do that, there's not going to be the energy left for your own, what's most important, your relationship. So let's make sure that we're budgeting our energy level. Um, then protect higher priorities from lower ones. Spiritual priorities must be protected. Teach, the, teach our kids that God is important. You know, David and I, we both, um, that's what we do every morning. We get up and we have our devotions and we go to separate places in our house. Um, we've kind of had a, a funny thing because I had, I had an office in, in our other home the doors close and, and I'm just this kind of person that I, I, I get distracted and I also like to have a view so thank you for this lake right here this has been great <laughs> these last couple of mornings um, but you know that's just who I am and so in the home that we're in now um, we have one office and and David uses that for business so that's his office and and that's good and so I kind of like, oh, this kitchen will be great. And I have the counter here, and I'll just, you know, have my time of praise music. And, and then he wants to come and eat his breakfast. <laughs> so we, we have had to work on this, and we, we have. We've worked it out where he's like, when, when do you want me to eat? <laughs> Which is terrible. I said, I'll sacrifice. No. But work it out. However you have to work it out. Have your time alone with the Lord, first thing. Because if you don't, then your spouse is going to say, wow, did you pray this morning? <laughs> and you're going to have to say, no, I didn't. So make sure that you have that. And then marriage priorities must be protected. That Teach your kids that. These are two very important things, that you have your time with the Lord, and you have your time with your spouse. And then children are next. Right. I'm a little confused because I'm trying to figure out if women are supposed to put their oxygen mask on first, then the children, when do they help us? <laughs> uh, seriously, just a little comment. The greatest gift that you can give your children the absolute greatest gift is a great marriage. Think about that. Principle number two, unity is essential. Mark 3.25, and this is Jesus speaking, says, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Uh, in Genesis 11.6, it says, and the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language now nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them success is dependent upon unity and failure is preceded by disunity so 
as parents, you have to be in unity. Somehow or another, I think there may be one mistake God made, tongue in cheek. He, he gave children an innate ability to figure out a way to divide mom and dad. I, I don't know how they get that, but they seem to know how to, to be able to try to create division between mom and dad. And we have to be able to never allow that division to compromise our marriage, because Jesus told us that a house divided will not fall. And there is absolutely no exception to that truth that he gave us. There's four essential practices that we want to cover here for promoting unity in our marriage as we parent our children's children successfully. The first one is always, and I say that with bold capital letters, always present a united front to your children. If you disagree about how something should be administered in regard to those children, go behind closed doors, disagree all you want, but then you have to come to agreement in private and then come out in public to those children and you have to stand in agreement. This is an essential leadership principle in the home and it actually translates into the workplace too, but that's a whole nother subject. Uh, but you have to do it in the home. Don't make significant parenting decisions without your spouse. You know, that, that thing of, well, Dad, can I go ride motorcycles? I'm six years old. Can I go ride motorcycles with Tommy? Well, sure, Mom's not around. Go ahead. No. You have to make big decisions together, and you have to do that. You know, in our household, uh, Vicki mentioned how each of us responded when our, our kids went off to, to college. There's a good reason for that. Her personality and our son's personality are pretty similar. Our daughter and myself, she got the really good genes. <laughs> she and I are a lot alike, okay? So we tend to, I tend to understand her perspective a little bit better, uh, and she tends to understand our son a little bit better. So. As we would talk things through, we would learn the whole, whole point of view and we would make better decisions together about how to lead our children. And you always honor each other in front of your children and make sure that your children honor your spouse. You know, I mentioned that our son was a, a, a nose tackle when he played football. Now, he, he's, he's not real tall, he's about 5'11", but he, he was about 240, 250 pounds, and at his peak, he could bench press about 405 pounds, okay? I wasn't gonna beat him up. <laughs> I, I might outrun him, but he was a big boy. And I remember one time when he was a, a senior in high school and he was beginning to f get a little full of himself, and Vicki was talking to him about something and he began to disrespect her. And I came in from the other room and I got right up to him and I looked at him and I said, you may think it's okay to talk to your mother like that, but you will not talk to my wife like that. And he looked at me like, I think that's the same person, <laughs> you know? and. You know, it, it broke, it kind of broke that spirit, at least for 24 hours, uh, where he understood where the line was. And you have to, you have to do that with one another. Uh, if you don't do that, you will destroy the unity. And unity means that what happens to you is happening to me because we're a team. So you do, to some extent, have to take it personal. Second uh, key practice is never allow a significant difference to develop in how you express love or you enforce punishment. So I'll say that in another way. In other words, in punishment, 
your children must, not, must know that you love and support them. You may feel like you want to kill them, but they shouldn't know that you feel like you want to kill them. So put the gun or the knife or whatever. You, know, you don't want them to, to know that. You want them to know you're upset, but you also want them to know that you love them the, you've heard the good cop, bad cop mentality. And, you know, honestly, I was kind of taught that as a child. You know, I, I remember my mom giving me a, a spanking one time, and I did just this really dumb thing. I, I laughed because it didn't hurt. When Dad got home, yeah, that wasn't good. Uh, good cop, bad cop doesn't work, and here's why. Because if, if you've learned that uh, or you've even practiced it, I want to go through a few things real quick to tell you why it doesn't work. First off, it creates a vicious cycle of extremes, all right? It eventually creates resentment between the two spouses because one of you is most likely operating differently than what you would really like to operate. And it creates confusion and damage in, in the kids and emotionally, they will not develop properly. Dads, I want to talk to you very, for just maybe 20 or 30 seconds, very specifically. Your children need love and affection from you just as much as they do mom. Okay? I am so blessed because a man told me when my daughter, uh, our daughter, was uh, like in the third or fourth grade, he said, Dave, I want you to understand something. Your daughter needs the love and affection from a man, and she needs that from you, or she will eventually get that from another man. And I understood what he was saying to me. And I, was, I determined from that point forward, the only other man who was ever going to show her love and affection was her husband. And I can stand here today and tell you that when my daughter got married and when she, she did not let her husband kiss her until she knew that his intention was marriage. And when she, he kissed her, that's only the second man in her life she ever kissed. I was the first. That was it. And I am so thankful to that man for telling me that. To this day, when we see our son, because he, he lives on the West Coast, so we only see him every few months. He knows the first thing Dad's going to do is embrace him, and I'm going to give him a big kiss either on the cheek or on the forehead, depending on how he turns his head. He knows. He knows. It's what happens. And he's gotten over it. <laughs> he knows. Um, so it's important, Dads. The last thing is, Go outside your marriage for counseling and input when you reach an impasse. This actually is not a sign of weakness. It shows wisdom and strength. And decide ahead of time you're going to submit to that wise, godly counsel. Now, this was not a huge deal, but, I, but at the time, it was like monumental to me. When our, our son was uh, 16 years old, we were living in Oregon. And I came home from being out of town on business uh, after a couple of days. And this is in the middle of the summer. It's 90 degrees outside. And we had a basketball court out back. And I saw him and some of his uh, half court. He and some of his friends were out there playing. Uh, and if you ever want a fun joke, watch a bunch of football players play basketball. It's hilarious. <laughs> anyway, he's playing basketball with a ski cap on. And it's 90 degrees. And I'm like, what is wrong with this kid? Well. I was in the house all of two minutes, and our daughter, who was like in the fourth grade, I think at that time, she, hey, Dad, guess what? Jason's got a mohawk, you know? And I'm like, a mohawk. And so I went out, and I said, why you got that hat on? He goes, well, I just wanted to wear a hat. I said, come on, take the hat off. He took, it was the ugliest looking mohawk you've ever seen in your life. I mean, there's some white guys that should not have mohawks, and he's, he's one of them. And, you know, we went to church, and I had all my friends teasing me about it. And I, I was wrong. I got, I got really like, man, this is like personal. This is a big problem, you know. And I made it into this huge thing, and Vicky's like, it's just a haircut. And I'm like, no, it's not. 
this is horrible. I mean, so anyway, make a long story short, I talked to the singles pastor. We talked to the singles pastor of the church who had played football through high school and college, so we thought he could understand the mentality a little bit. And uh, he listened to me go on and on. He goes, Dave, it's just a haircut. I go, Chip, I know, but he goes, here's my suggestion. Tell him he can do anything with his hair that he wants to as long as he doesn't carve anything obscene or immoral or that would contradict your faith in his head or whatever, whatever's left of his hair. And uh, not in his skin, I mean, you know. And I'm like, oh, man, okay. Okay, so I, I did that. The next day, he goes to school. He comes home. Zip, the mohawk's gone. And then he, he grew it. Grew, he realized he was getting made fun of for having no hair. And then he grew it out a little bit, put it into a marine cut. And if he were here today, he still has the same haircut now. 20 some years later, he still has the same haircut. Uh, it, it works, but you have to have your plan uh, ahead of time for what you're gonna do. The third principle, parenting takes faith. Parenting takes faith because it's a process and many of the desired results will not be seen. In fact, most of the results will not be seen immediately. You know, you have to have faith in God's word, in his love, and his power, okay? Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, okay? Operative word here is train. Training does not mean talking, okay? Now, talking's part of training, but training is showing them how to live. In my uh, business world, in my Wendy's world, we have a four-corner, what we call four-corner training. And what, what that is, is the first thing is we have the person read and understand what it is they're going to learn. Then the second thing is we demonstrate for them. And then the third, they do it, and we watch them observe and give feedback. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the third and the fourth step put together. We're watching them, then we give them feedback. Imagine if we thought of parenting that same way. Instead of, I raised you to make do things differently than that, and so now since you didn't do it right, you know, whatever's going to happen. Our job is to train and teach them. How can we exercise faith in parenting? First off, Never blame yourself or blame your spouse for your children being imperfect or going through a difficult time. It's a process. It takes time. You, we, you won't see it happen over time, or you will see it happen over time. Most of the time, you won't see it happen well instantaneously. Think of it as a farmer. As a parent, you're planting, you're watering, and you're tending the soil of your child's heart. That's what you're doing. And so be, be a patient and positive farmer, even when you want to run over them with the tractor. Don't take a picture, and this is a big one, don't take a picture of your current circumstances and give up. Jimmy Evans talks about prophetic versus photographic thinking. And I can explain this real quickly, but I really hope you, you ponder it. Uh, photographic thinking is taking that mental picture of where they are today and going, oh my goodness, I'm going to be visiting this child in prison someday because of the horrible decisions they're making. Prophetic thinking is Jeremiah. what it says in Jeremiah. I know the plans for you plans to prosper you, give you a hope of a new future. You know, God's given you great gifts, and he is going to see those fulfilled in your life. That's a big difference, a big, big difference. Uh, we had one child who, had, who was very early in her life, Rochelle, committed her ways to the Lord. Our son had to have his own train wreck, first 
And things that we thought were train wrecks weren't train wrecks. And what turned his heart, we would have never thought turned his heart, but it did. And so uh, you have to stay with that prophetic thinking. Do what God's word says. And you know what? My wife, I wish I could stand here and tell you that I had done this, but uh, I didn't. My wife did this. Early on, she decided that every Friday morning, she was going to fast and pray for our children. This started when they were little. And pray for them and pray for their spouses. And God gave both of them the perfect spouse for them. Not only followers of Jesus, but in every way, shape, or form, they fit. They are one. And it's because of that commitment that she made to do that. Pray together about issues and problems. To, even to this day, Vicki and I, especially I think it happens more with our son and daughter-in-law because we don't see them, you know, the, the, our daughter and her family, we see them multiple times a week, but our son and daughter-in-law, we see them every few months. When we leave, we talk about what do we see happening? How should we be praying for them? What, what, do we want, what do we want to ask God to do in their life? I have on my cell phone a little file in this thing called Dropbox that I don't fully understand how it works, but I know how to use it. Where I have, I've asked my kids, what do you want me to pray for you? So that just about every day I'm praying what they're asking, and then I add to it a little bit for what I see. You know, there's these three pr powerful principles can help us with marriage and so that we build our marriages. We give that greatest gift to our children of a great marriage, and we end up raising great children. Remember, marriage precedes children priority. Unity is essential for success, and parenting takes faith. Now, as Vicki's coming up, and she's going to lead us in the last couple's prayer uh, before we close out. I, I, there's one other thing I, I want to mention to you. You know, we've talked yesterday and then again today about priorities, our own relationship with Christ first, marriage second. You probably got it down by now. Children, church, okay? One of the most common places that that we see this violated and not done well is with in the church and in, and in particular with pastors not that pastors are trying to violate it but oftentimes the ministry the church influences and says oh the church is more important than this or other I want to challenge all of you. You have an awesome pastor. You have an awesome pastor. And he and Patty are absolutely wonderful, wonderful people. And they're a blessing from God. And I, we want to encourage you to not only pray pray that God enables you to keep those priorities, but that you pray for them that they are always keeping those priorities because God can do his best work here as all of us stay with the priorities and the four foundational laws of marriage. And one of the last things that I want to say, too, is um, I really felt impressed by the Holy Spirit to just mention, you know, I don't know um, where your children might be, but no matter where they are, they're not far from God. And as our son was struggling, um, the Lord heard our prayers, and we prayed. Second Corinthians chapter 10, it talks about how the, the weapons that we fight with are not man-made weapons. They're from God. <laughs> And with these weapons, what he does is he takes a rebel's heart and he changes that heart into a man whose heart's desire is obedience to Christ. 
And as we prayed that, that's what we've seen occur in our own son's life. So no matter where your child might be, God can do an incredible, miraculous thing. Just, you know, commit to fasting and prayer. So let's go ahead and close with our couple's prayer. Take your hands and of your spouse. God, we thank you so much for our children. Relating to kids helps us understand how you relate and love us, God. Help us prioritize our marriage first and foremost in front of our children so that we can show them how to love their future spouse. God, we repent to each other and to you for when we have not been uni united in front of our kids, God. Give us patience and faith to be the parents that you desire from us this day forward. Amen. Dave and Vicki, we just want to thank you uh, for pouring into us the, the last couple of days. Would you give them a hand, let them know that you appreciate them. You, you both have just such a, a gentle, sweet spirit, but yet you're able to deliver some tough words. That uh, wouldn't you like them to be your parents? Like if they, if, if someone's going to rebuke you, like I want them to rebuke me. Like totally opposite. Tomorrow I'll be screaming at you. And <laughs> I believe the Lord sent you here because we, we we need a dose of some honey. <laughs> That's it's good, good, good stuff. And uh, you know if if we take what we've learned over the past couple of days. Uh, and, and if we just take this book and we just file it away like everything else, it's not going to do us much good. It's not going to do us much good. We have to be, the Bible says, don't be hearers only. James chapter 1, you can't just be a hearer of God's word. You've got to be a doer of it. Otherwise, we just deceive ourselves and thinking, hey, I did. I made an investment in, in my marriage. No, not unless you're going to work it out and walk it out and do something with it. See, I'm, I, I just can't be nice. <laughs> But we do thank you guys. They, they drove, it's, it's almost 600 miles or something like that they drove to be with us and, and spend a couple days with us. So we appreciate you very, very much. Um, so we're, we're going to dismiss. But if we have anyone who, uh, we didn't get a lot of questions. And, and I know, uh, you know, sometimes it's weird because if you ask a question, it's, it's oftentimes you're asking a question of what, you want your spouse to hear, <laughs> and uh, and so that gets that gets a little uh, odd. And then you don't want to ask a question because you'll think everyone will know it's me. Uh, so we probably should have done something anonymously online or something like that. But if you do have some questions, you could talk to them afterwards. We don't want to keep them all day because they've got to get on the road. They're going to drive back to be at their church tomorrow morning uh, in Kentucky. So it'll be a long day from them or for them. But uh, if you do have a prayer need today and you'd like them. To, to pray with you. Uh, Brandon's going to play a little bit on the piano and, uh, and uh, we'll be dismissed. But if you've got a prayer need, I want you to make sure that you come up, okay? Let's all pray together and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you so much for these last couple of days. I, uh, I, I know I have learned so much and I believe those who are here uh, have too. Uh, God, of things that we can do, uh, hiding your word in our heart, uh, that we might not sin against you or sin against our spouse. And God, just to build on the foundation of your word that we can have great marriages. We believe that, God, and raise great kids and be great uh, in-laws and grandparents, Father. And it's never too late to change. I thank you for the message of hope we have heard. We can change right now. We can start right now. We give you praise and thanks for that. Bless all those who have come over the past couple of days, God. We pray you just pour your spirit out upon us. Pray that you bring us back tomorrow morning for a great time of celebrating your grace in our lives. We just give you glory and honor for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed. But again, if you'd like some prayer, uh, please don't be shy. Nothing to be ashamed of. We can all use prayer. God with us and God for